morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and wonderful audiences of the ACNS webinars in different parts of the world. Welcome to yet another edition of wonderful lectures for you. The first speaker for today is a world-renowned neurosurgeon, Professor William Goodwell. He serves as a professor and chair of Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Utah. He has served as the director of the American Board of Neurological Surgery, and he was a past president of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons and American Academy of Neurological Surgery. Dr. Goodwell has over 450 peer-reviewed publications and has been the recipient of several federal and other research grants. He is recognized internationally for his expertise in skull-based surgery and is regularly solicited as a speaker to instruct courses in skull-based surgery. His clinical interests include surgical management of skull-based tumors, neuro-oncology, pituitary tumors, and cerebrovascular neurosurgery. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker with us, and he'll be talking about surgery of the orbit for neurosurgeons. The second speaker for today is our honored guest from China, Professor Guang Cheng. Professor Cheng is a professor and director of neurointerventional mm -hmm. department, the first affiliated hospital of Chengchou University. He also serves as the chairman of the professional committee of neurointervention of radiological credit society of the Chinese Medical Association. He is the vice chairman of the Henan Stroke Society, chairman of the neurointervention branch of the Henan Stroke Society and Henan Provisional Interventional Therapy Professional Committee. He is a noted author with over 170 publications in various peer-reviewed journals. He is also a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Chinese Medicine, Chinese Intervention Radiology, Electronic Edition of Chinese Journal of Cerebrovascular Disease, and the Journal of Intervention Radiology. We are extremely honored to have him today with us, and today he'll be talking about selection of stent aims to correct flow in the aneurysm neck. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our distinguished guest from Japan, Professor Takashi Sugawara. Professor Sugawara is an associate professor at the Department of Neurosurgery at the Tokyo Medical and Dental University Graduate School, Japan. He did his skull base and research fellowship at the Arkansas Neuroscience Institute, CHX, and Vincent. His clinical practice is focused upon skull base and craniofacial surgery. He has received several awards and honors for his outstanding contribution towards neurosurgery in his country. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Kudwell. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is honored guest from Japan, Professor Nobutaka Hori. Professor Hori is the professor and chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Hiroshima University, Japan. Professor Hori is an important member of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society and Japanese Society of Stroke and Japanese Society of Neuroendovascular Therapy. He has done his postdoc fellowship at the Stanford University, USA. He is a noted author with several publications in various period journals. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Guan Cheng. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yoko Kaito, I would like to welcome all the chair speakers and the audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A warm welcome to our colleagues in China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to the first chair, Professor Takashi Sugawara. And hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us. But today, we have Dr. William Cole from University of Utah. As everyone know, and as Dr. Larger introduced now, Professor William Cole is one of the most famous neurosurgeon in the world. And she published more than 700 papers. And Orbital surgery is one of his uh, the specialized fields, and he once said the skull surgeon needs to be an orbital surgeon as well. I totally agree with him. And today he's going to talk to us a valuable lecture about orbital surgery. And Professor Caldwell, I'd like to really thank you for taking the time today. And uh, please go ahead your lecture when you're ready. Thank you, Dr. Sugahara, and also to Dr. Raja and Dr. Kato uh, for the invitation. This is really an honor. And today I'd like to speak about um, orbital surgery. Well, again, this is an, it's an honor for me to be here. And I know it's evening uh, in, in most of Asia. It's very early in the morning here, but this is where I'm from in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. It's a beautiful state and some of the most dramatic national parks. So if you come to visit, it, we'd be honored to have you. Um, this is our Neurosciences Institute, and uh, you could visit the beautiful parks just south of us. So it's interesting, and, and I just note that skull base surgery is unique in a lot of ways. Uh, we have a very big catchment area, as we're the only academic medical center. And I just show you this case for you to think about, because um, this is a woman who lived in Montana, and she went blind uh, two years ago, and she's got this massive skull base tumor. This was adenoid cystic when it was biopsied in Montana and sent down to us. 
and she's uh, very sick now because of all the shift and the mass effect from the tumor. And the point that I'd like to make is, is that um, some of our most difficult skull-based tumors are rare. They're variable in size, location, and the ability to invade the arteries, especially. The approaches are multiple and complications are often unpredictable. And this is compared to a lot of other things that we do in our specialty and other surgeons do. So if heart bypass is quite uniform, carotid endarterectomies, and we do a lot of those, that's a fairly standard operation, including some of the bypass operations. But skull-based tumors are each one is a unique challenge uh, because of its location and its consistency. So where are we going in skull-based surgery? I think that skull-based surgeons need to be familiar with the orbit. And I just uh, point to these beautiful uh, legacy of the, all the anatomical work that was uh, left by Dr. Roten. And uh, when I was, uh, during the time that I was on the executive committee and the president of the, of the AANS, we actually got Dr. Roten's material all uh, codified and put online. Uh, and it's really a tremendous legacy, probably a greatest legacy that I've seen of a neurosurgeon uh, leaving um, their work uh, for all the world to use uh, for free. So when I was a young neurosurgeon, we were very familiar with the cavernous sinus and we were very interested in operating in the cavernous sinus, but really our interest stopped when the tumor entered the orbit. And it's a continuum, obviously. And this rotin collection uh, is amazing in that uh, it's all of the codochromes. He had 10,000 codochromes that were all cleaned up by Dr. Jeff Sorensen in, in uh, Memphis. And each one of them became uh, uh, codified and selected. And you can see, you can select anything here and it's highlighted. And then all of his lectures were put online as well. So it's a tremendous resource for all of us to use. But let's talk about the orbit. So there's seven bones that make up the orbit. The frontal, sphenoid, zygomatic, maxillary, palatine, ethmoid, and lacrimal. So the frontal you're all familiar with, the sphenoid, the zygomatic, the maxilla, the palatine, the ethmoid, and the lacrimal, which is a small bone medially in the orbit. Now, even the anterior cranial fossa, as you know, is not flat. And the, uh, the tumors, uh, the, the bone is, is rough. And uh, it also the olfactory area is a groove. So even when you're approaching a tumor to the olfactory groove transcranially, um, you want to think about your trajectory and whether you'll be able to see the base of the skull properly. So if you come too low frontally here, you may not be able to see down in the olfactory groove. And I often do big olfactory groove tumors just from a standard uh, unilateral approach to be able to come down on the side of the worst smell and then remove the tumor and try to preserve smell on the other side if we can. Now, the interesting thing about the orbit is that the structures often come in laterally in the orbit and they migrate medially. So here's the fourth nerve, which crosses the third nerve at the superior orbital fissure, an important relationship that I use all the time when I look at when I'm doing cavernous sinus and orbital surgery. Here's the fifth nerve. It's the one branch of the fifth nerve, the frontal branch coming up as the supraorbital nerve and um, lying on top of the levator and also the superior rectus muscle. Even the veins coming in, the superior ophthalmic vein, they migrate from lateral to medial, including the ophthalmic artery and it's important relationship. So you need to understand the relationship of the nerves and the direction the nerves are going. Here's the fourth nerve going to the trochlear uh, the, or the uh, superior op, uh, oblique muscle. And uh, here's the levator and the superior rectus uh, retracted and you can see the optic nerve beneath. In most cases, the ophthalmic artery goes over the optic nerve and here's a superior ophthalmic a vein running over the globe in this uh, particular case. And of course, the sixth nerve is coming in and innervating the lateral rectus. So we, we did write a review on the way that we look at this, and there's sort of two ways to look at approaches uh, to the orbit. So you can look at approaches to orbital pathology directly, or you can look at uh, the orbit as a conduit to do other approaches in the cranial space. And I think both of those are interesting options for the neurosurgeon. 
Um, and I'm a, a, a sort of, I like to simplify things. And if you look at pathology in the lateral or the superior aspect of the orbit, we often use lateral orbital approaches or a, or a uh, supraorbital uh, craniotomy for the resection. And I'll show you examples of that. Here's a table demonstrating all the pathology that occurs in the orbit. Many of the common things that occur in the orbit, like meningioma, uh, hemangioma, et cetera, we're very familiar with, and we can use our surgical techniques to address. And they may be extension of intracranial disease as in meningioma quite commonly. If you have disease in the inferior orbit or the medial orbit in this location, these transfacial approaches are beautiful, either transethmoidally here or transnasally. And you can create a common cavity between the nasal pharynx and the maxillary sinus by taking away the medial maxillary wall. And it gives you a beautiful corridor into the inferior region of the orbit. It's a fairly standard approach. Here's an example. Here's an hemangioma a man with visual loss and proptosis. And we'll go ahead and do an endonasal approach in this case, um, endoscopically to go ahead and remove this tumor. Uh, we'll take away the medial termitate, open up the uncinate process, which allows you access to the foramen uh, into the maxillary sinus. That's what we're doing here. And then taking away the medial maxillary wall. And here's the medial maxillary wall being removed and you end up here with the inferior pack and medial part of the orbit beautifully exposed. And this tumor now is removed just like a transcranial approach. So we'll, we'll open up into the region of the tumor, we'll debulk the tumor, and then we'll find the interface between the tumor and the uh, periorbital fat. Uh, and so here we're just now coming around the tumor it's vascular, but very simple, simple operation, the way that we do, would do this transcranially. And we reduce the tumor down to its uh, pedicle of vascular attachment in this case. And then we'll go ahead and cauterize that and then uh, remove the tumor completely. Now for a defect this size, uh, we wouldn't bother uh, reconstructing the orbit. You can see some herniated orbital fat here but it's a simple closure. And then his post-op scan shows uh, improvement of the proptosis and his optic nerve uh, was left intact. And obviously his vision uh, was stable, actually improved after surgery. Um, <clears throat> if you have a tumor that's above the optic nerve, you really wanna come transcranial uh, superiorly. And I'll show you, this is a V1 schwannoma in a young man who is losing vision. And so the standard approach would be a transcranial orbitotomy here. And I just wanna point out some important structures that when you do this, uh, remember that the, uh, the orbit is very forgiving, but you need to know where the structures run through the orbit. And so what I'm doing here is we're, here's the meningo orbital band, uh, the clinoid. So we're removing the bone on top of the orbit. And you can see the uh, levator muscle here, and uh, the superior rectus runs immediately below it. And what you wanna do is you wanna come in medially, if you can, to the levator, because the third nerve innervates the levator and the superior rectus from inferiorly. So if you come in and medially here, um, and then, then the nerve uh, is supplying the muscles coming in laterally and inferiorly, and so you'll be, be free of uh, the third nerve and you won't leave the patient with the third nerve palsy. So we'll open up into the tumor. It's uh, somewhat cystic here. You'll see a gush of fluid. And uh, then it's just like removing a, a schwannoma anywhere else in the head. And we can use our uh, same microsurgical technique. And this is really in our wheelhouse. This is really our specialty, microsurgical removal of these tumors. And we're actually much more facile at this because we're doing it all the time uh, as compared to some of our uh, ophthalmology colleagues. And so I've had a wonderful relationship with uh, Bupi Patel here in Utah, and we've worked out a number of these different approaches to the orbit, and it's been a really fruitful relationship. So we'll remove the tumor. Uh, we got into the frontal sinus here, so we'll seal that off and uh, put a pericranial flap over that as well. 
So it's a simple operation for us to do. Um, this is an interesting uh, variant of V1 and, uh, and trigeminal schwannoma. And Sam Elmefti and I published a series of these patients just recently. But you can get some of these schwannomas that are segmental. And we think it's a, a variant of a segmental schwannomatosis uh, genetically. But it's very rare. But it's an example of a, of a patient here. And here's one of my patients I'll show you a video on with a cystic schwannoma in the cavernous sinus extending out into the orbit, right out to uh, the orbital rim. And so uh, this young woman presented. Um, this with, is a 22 year old young woman. Proptosis with progressive. and uh, visual loss. And she's got this lesion that's quite dramatic and causing um, a mass effect on the orbit an obvious tumor in the cavernous sinus as well here, cystic tumor. You can see it's extending out all along the region of the, of the first division of the trigeminal nerve. It's also extending down into the second division. So what we'll do is we'll do a combined orbital and cavernous sinus approach here. And uh, we'll do it through frontal temporal craniotomy. Now, what we'll do is we'll do a frontal osteotomy in, in conjunction with our uh, frontal temporal approach here, an orbital frontal uh, osteotomy here, and just remove the orbital rim with the flap, and then uh, expose the frontal temporal area. And we'll start right behind the orbital rim here and start to dissect out the region of the tumor. Now, it's important on a V1 tumor that you're really careful. We need to preserve the nerve if we can. So the goal here is to remove as much of the tumor as we can safely without permanently injuring the uh, first division because this can result in uh, keratitis and blindness. So we'll go ahead and do a, a standard Dolank and uh, Hakuba approach to the cavernous sinus here. And you can see that the uh, fifth nerve is splayed and <clears throat> we'll bring down the meningoorbital band and now we find a window into our tumor. And it's just like removing a tumor anywhere else, fifth nerve schwannoma, fairly, uh, very gratifying and uh, fairly simple to remove in this location. And then we'll follow out the, the tumor all the way out into the orbit now. And what we're doing is we're removing the solid portions of the tumor and trying to leave uh, V1 intact. And so you can see this is a skip lesion. So there's uh, cystic areas, and there's areas of normal nerve, and then there's areas of tumor involvement. So we're following it carefully out and removing uh, the tumor as we go uh, anteriorly here. Here's a, a, a nugget of tumor on the fifth nerve, and we'll gently remove all the mass uh, of this tumor and try to preserve um, the normal nerve. So at the end of the case, we'll go ahead and close the periorbita try and reduce uh, the risk of venophthalmus and, um, and then proceed with closure. And if you, look, um, if you look at her scan at the end, you'll see that she's had reduction in her proptosis and we removed all the mass of the, uh, of the, of the tumor. Now, to, obviously, these meningiomas can involve the cavernous sinus and um, uh, the orbit. And the important aspect when we're operating on these meningiomas in the orbit is that to find this plane, and I'll show you with another case as well, to find the plane that differentiates the tumor from the periorbital and the orbital fat, okay? And so this is the critical aspect, is to be able to go ahead and remove the tumor and then um, find the plane with the normal periorbital structures. And so we'll debulk the tumor and then remove the tumor from the orbit completely in this particular case. And you can see now there's periorbital fat. We're decompressing the optic nerve. And we'll remove all the tumor that we can safely. So I'd also like to just mention fibrous dysplasia because it can be a dreadful disease. This is one of the worst cases I've seen, and I've operated on this young man several times. 
but the obviously the disease can involve the region of the orbit. And here he's got visual loss and terrible proptosis uh, from his tumor or, or from his fibrous dysplasia. And this is how extensive this can, disease can become. He actually had um, compression of his cranial structures that we had to do decompressive craniectomies on as well. It can be very vascular in this case, and these can be challenging cases. But let's talk about meningioma much more commonly. And uh, the problem that we have with meningioma is the following. So here's a, a case where there was a middle fossa meningioma removed, and the patient kept going back to her surgeon, and the surgeon kept telling her that the tumor is gone, uh, but her eye was proptotic, and obviously there's sphenoorbital involvement here, and there's hyperostosis in the sphenoid void, which is very common. Here's a very extreme case. Um, this is a woman from Eastern Europe that I operated on several years ago now, but she came in and she had this tumor for years. She had progressive proptosis, and you can see what they're, the problem here is that she's got soft tissue tumor outside of her head, in the middle fossa, and in the orbit. And there's phenoorbital bone involved here as well. So remember, thickened bone from meningioma is tumor. And that's been proven to us by Dr. Almefti and others. And we can measure the proptosis that we see in these patients by comparing it to the control eye that's not involved. So you get a proptosis index by measuring the length of this trajectory compared to this trajectory. And so I've become very, very uh, much more aggressive with this operation than I used to because I wasn't happy with the proptosis improvement that I saw. And so I evolved into a more radical approach that we published some years ago, but I'll show you how it's done. And what we do is, uh, luckily, in most cases, the orbital rim is not involved. So the bone that's hyperostotic is usually behind the orbital rim. So you can often leave the orbital rim intact as your natural landmark. And we'll remove all the bone of the lateral orbit and the superior orbit to decompress the orbital contents. And then we'll remove all the tumor in the orbit as well. And that's the difference here, is that we're much more aggressive with the tumor in the orbit. So here's a case in point. Here's another case where there's a middle fossa meningioma. He's got proptosis. He's got a congested eye. It's painful. Um, and they're likely to exposure as well. You can see the hyperostotic bone, and so we'll do a complete bone removal of all this area and decompress the eye. So let me just show you how this is done in that case uh, of the woman with a really profound proptosis. She actually still had a functional eye, believe it or not, and you can see that she came in in, uh, in trouble. She's got a lot of edema around the tumor, and she was actually trapping her ventricles and she was starting to herniate. You can see the medial horn of the temporal horn here on the, um, on the right side. So we'll go ahead and uh, frontotemporal approach, and there's tumor in the muscle here. And the idea then is to drill down and drill all the involved bone because we consider that tumor very vascular. And this bone can be an inch or two thick sometimes, several millimeters thick. So it can take a while to drill this. Here's the hyperostotic bone of the roof. And you can see here's the orbit that I've exposed, but the orbit is all involved with tumor. And so we'll go ahead and decompress the optic nerve and remove the hyperostotic clinoid. Here's the optic nerve, very large clinoid that's hyperostotic, and we'll remove that. And then we'll approach the tumor in the orbit. And that's what I wanted to show you because We'll remove the lateral orbital wall as well. Here's V2. And then go ahead and <clears throat> I'm gonna show you how I deal with the orbital uh, tumor itself. So we start right behind the orbital rim and I identify the plane between the periorbital and the tumor in the periorbita and then dissect it posteriorly. And you can see uh, what you do is just follow this plane. You can use your self-retaining retractors to hold the periorbital fat and just follow the plane back to the region of the annulus of Zinn. Now you'll have to make a decision if the tumor is invading the muscles, whether you're going to remove some of the muscle with the tumor removal. But in most cases, it's not invading the annulus of Zinn. So we'll go ahead and close the dura 
And then I've completely stopped reconstructing the orbit. And the reason is I'll show you very clear. So we got into the maxillary sinus here and the ethmoid sinus. We plug that off. We got into the frontal sinus. We'll plug that off and then go ahead and just place fat around the region of the orbit so we don't get constriction with movement of the orbit and the globe. Now, this is what she looks like when we bring her back two weeks later for a custom cranioplasty because we had to remove so much bone that was involved. And I'll show you what she looks like, but it's dramatic, the improvement in proptosis. Now you'll say, well, why don't we get enophthalmus? And I'll show you why. So we published 38 patients, but I've done over 100 now, and we're updating this series. Um, it is important to make sure that you remove all the bone. And this is uh, the major part of this operation is drilling the bone to be able to decompress the orbit. And even we've had recurrence of bony recurrences without soft tissue recurrence. Here's an example of that. So if you look at the proptosis in these patients, uh, this is what we found. We found that some of them had terrible proptosis, but we never created enophthalmus in any of them. So they never overcorrected. So I think that's an important observation. And it indicates to me that the sphenoorbital meningioma is a unique disease in that there's so much disease around the orbit it, and it's so much proptosis, it does not overcorrect even if you don't uh, reconstruct the orbit. Um, so one other point that I'd like to make is something that, um, that Ann Osborne taught me here in Utah, that when meningiomas grow next to sinuses, they can cause blistering of the sinus. And this we call pneumosinus dilatans. And we published a paper on this and, and you can read about it, but basically what happens is as the tumor grows, it causes increased blistering of the sinuses. Now, when this occurs on the tuberculum, like this tumor, it's actually in, it enhances your ability to remove it endoscopically and transnasally. Uh, we had three grades of this, but basically what happens is it opens up the area of exposure to your tuberculum meningioma. So it facilitates an endonasal removal. But the point that I like to make is that in some cases, the pneumosinus dilatans is what is the major mass on the, on the orbit. And you can see here, so you need to get in there and I'm not, for time, I'm not gonna show you the video, but you need to get in there, remove this tumor, but also open up the sinus so that you can decompress the orbit as well. So orbital meningiomas, aggressive removal of bone and soft tissue in all cases. We remove intraclonal tumor if it's not attached to the muscles and considering removal of the tumor involving the muscle in younger patients. And that these results suggest that aggressive surgical resection of meningioma associated proptosis results in significant improvement. So let's talk about different approaches to the orbit and using the orbit as a conduit to, to approach cranial disease. And I really want to talk about that for a minute. And it's interesting, if you look at the term, um, so when Cushing was doing uh, approaches for meningiomas and supercellular pituitary tumors, he used a subfrontal approach. And it was really Dandy and Hoyer that understood that if you came a little bit laterally, uh, you get a better view behind the optic nerve, you can see the carotid artery, and it gives you more exposure and more flexibility. So we quickly adopted that, of course, as the frontotemporal approach, which is the workhorse approach that we all use on a weekly basis. The first use of the term terional was in 1964 by Hamby. And it was really Yassergill in the 60s and the 70s that really popularized the frontotemporal approach to anterior circulation and basilar apex aneurysms. But it was our observation that if you come in, and here's a woman with squamous cell carcinoma of her face involving the orbit, you can see the inferior rectus here is involved. And we'll go ahead and do a, a uh, exenteration in this case. And when you do a resection in these people, you find that you have a beautiful view of the cavernous sinus. Here's the anterior loop of the carotid with this resection. And <clears throat> these operations are very well tolerated because we're barely touching the brain as we go. Um, and with closure, the people do very well 
and they uh, don't have any neurological problems, usually with the exception of obviously the orbit and, um, and the fifth nerve. Now, if you look at the orbit, it's about four centimeters from the orbital rim to the cavernous sinus. It's not the closest operation to the cavernous sinus. The, the, the shortest operation is actually through the maxillary sinus. And we published that many years ago, but this is a short approach. And it's a little bit different trajectory, but you can use this approach to, to remove tumors in the cavernous sinus, in the orbit, and also intracranially. And I'll show you this. We published this maybe 10 years ago now, but uh, this is a, is a beautiful little approach for limited pathology in the cavernous sinus. This is a 65-year-old woman who had had a bone marrow transplant um, for a leukemia two years previously, and she ended up with a new cavernous sinus lesion and painful ophthalmoplegia. And so the oncologist would wanted a biopsy. And so what we can do is we can just do a simple biopsy through this lateral orbitotomy approach. I fork the incision. So you bring along the lateral canthus. Don't take it any more than a centimeter back behind the orbital rim because of uh, worry about the facial nerve, uh, the frontalis branch. You come right down on the orbital rim and then you use either an oscillating saw, this is a C1 on the Midas, uh, to be able to remove this orbital rim. Uh, you can fit the plates to it before you remove the bone. So this ensures good opposition when you reconstruct. And then remove the bone of the orbital rim. And you can do this simply by undercutting. And you can even just take a Lexel and just break it off right there. And then you drill along the wall on the lateral orbital wall. And then you can drill into the middle cranial fossa here. And what I'm doing here is I'm lifting up um, the dura of the middle cranial fossa on the fifth nerve, exposing uh, the trigeminal nerve here. Here's V1. And there's the tumor you can see. And it's obviously not a recurrence of her uh, lymphoma or her leukemia. Uh, this is a different tumor. This was a a weird tumor related to her bone marrow transplant. It was a soft tissue tumor of the, um, of the muscles. Um, and so we'll go ahead and do an excisional biopsy. And there's no closure here because we just remove the bone. It's extra dural. And then we close the soft tissue and then close the skin. And um, you'll see us uh, closing the skin. I use a subcuticular stitch. It's just absorbable and remove the guard over the eye and then the patient usually goes home uh, the next day. So you can do this for meningioma as well. Here's a seven-year-old man with some visual loss. He's got meningioma with his cavernous sinus, and we can go ahead and do a optic nerve decompression through this operation. Here I'm removing the clinoid process, and we'll drill out the optic canal at the same time, and you get a beautiful view. It's a different trajectory. It's more anterior than coming through a standard frontotemporal approach and then decompress the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus. This is what he looks like post-op. This is six months later. You see there's no involvement of the temporalis muscle here. You come under the temporalis muscle, so there's no wasting. And you see I've removed the clinoid and opened up the canal. So here's a case I did just probably a week ago. This is a 58-year-old man with seizures, large cavernous malformation. And we do a lateral orbitotomy approach to the region of the medial temporal lobe. And here's our opening. You can see, and there's the lateral orbital rim. So a beautiful trajectory coming right down the medial temporal area. And we remove the lesions of the anterior amygdala and hippocampus as well uh, with that approach. You can see uh, what we've done. Uh, we're just actually publishing this initial experience now. But I'd like to talk about some work of others that have extended this area, and they're using these types of approaches to, to define what you can reach transcranially. And I think this is a very, very interesting area. The endoscope helps us with this. But the idea being, these are cadaver studies, is that you can define regions of bone to remove in the orbit and use the orbit as your conduit to remove intracranial or to access intracranial pathology. So I think it's a, it's a really interesting, fascinating area that will evolve quickly over the next few years. Um, here's another temporal cavernous malformation. I think because of time, I won't show you removal, but this is what you see. 
of when you remove, open up and into the anterior temporal area and remove the cavernous malformation. And then I just wanna to talk to you about something that, that we worked on over the last year or so, and this is just being published. It's a one-step approach to an optic nerve uh, glioma. And again, glioma, this is an approach, this is a, a neurosurgical disease in when it involves the optic nerve. And traditionally, it's done by two different approaches. It's done by a combined approach with the frontotemporal approach uh, by a neurosurgeon and cutting the optic nerve, and then a transorbital approach by an ophthalmic surgeon coming supraorbitally and cutting the nerve behind the globe, and then the tumor being removed that way. The indications for removing an optic nerve uh, glioma are usually a patient's with a blind eye, and then also progression of disease, and also proptosis. And remember, these are low-grade gliomas, and if we can stop them and remove them completely, we can avoid the tumor extending into the chiasm and into the contralateral nerve and then threatening the vision on the other side. It's important to understand the anatomy of this area because this is the crucial part of this operation is the annulus of Zinn. So the annular tendon incorporates the optic canal, which obviously transmits to the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery, and then the medial aspect of the superior orbital fissure. So you have to understand what goes through the annulus of Zinn and what doesn't. So what uh, goes through this is the annular tendon is the insertion of the rectus muscles. As I said, the optic nerve, the ophthalmic artery, the third nerve, the fourth nerve, and some branches of, or the sixth nerve and some branches of five. The fourth nerve does not go through it. And I think it's important to remember um, uh, the anatomy and you need to review the anatomy, but I'm gonna talk and let this video play because this is just being published now. Optic nerve glioma will remove the involved optic nerve from just anterior to the chiasm to the globe. This is a 28-year-old woman with progressive visual loss. She had an enhancing lesion in her right optic nerve that was progressing. She had two biopsies by the ophthalmology group that demonstrated a low-grade glioma. Given the progressive visual loss and the progression of her tumor, we offered her a resection of her right optic nerve. She's positioned here for a right frontotemporal approach for a frontal orbitocranial approach to the optic glioma. The incision is as outlined here. And we'll perform a myocutaneous opening and a frontotemporal flap. After elevation of the flap, the roof of the orbit is drilled and we perform an extra drill dissection and identify the meningo orbital band, which is cut and dissected down to expose the clinoid. We then drill the lateral and the superior orbit. The periorbit is identified and is left intact at this point. We then unroof the optic canal and identify the optic nerve. After exposure of the superior orbit, we continue our removal of the roof to the level of the globe and then remove the anterior clinoid process. After drilling the optic strut, we loosen the clinoid, which is removed. The carotid is identified. We then open the dura in a T-shaped fashion, following the sylvian fissure, and then teeing it at the frontal base and the anterior temporal dura. We identify the intradural optic nerve and carotid artery. The chiasm is identified. We will then plan to divide the optic nerve approximately two millimeters anterior to the chiasm to respect Willebrand's knee. After the optic nerve is transected, we then open up the falciform ligament 
and follow the nerve within the canal. The annulus of Zin is identified. We will then open up medial to the levator palpebrae, taking care not to injure the frontal branch of V1. We then identify the proximal optic nerve in the orbit. Cranial nerve four is identified just passing over the distal end of the annulus of Zin and will dissect immediately on the optic nerve, which is thickened in this case. The nasociliary nerve is identified crossing the optic nerve. We then continue our dissection on the optic nerve using self-retaining retractors to hold back the periorbital fat. We then identify the region of the optic nerve that was biopsied previously, which is very scarred. And we approach the globe. The nerve is then transected just as it exits the globe. We then elevate the nerve and free it of its investments and dissect it back towards the annulus of Zin. Now the key step in this procedure is to gently dissect the nerve from its investments within the annulus of Zin without interrupting the nasociliary nerve or the fourth nerve. We're able to remove this as one specimen from the chiasm to the globe. We then close by reapproximating the annulus of Zin and reapproximating the periorbita. We then perform a reconstruction of the orbit using a MedPOR preformed plate that is titanium and MedPOR. In this case, we enter the frontal sinus with the frontal temporal flap, and this is isolated by sewing a vascularized pericranial flap over the defect. The bone flap is replaced, and a cranioplasty of MedPOR is fashioned. The muscle is closed in separate layers as is the scalp. Her post operative imaging demonstrates complete resection of the optic nerve on this side. And she was stable from a neurological standpoint postoperatively with a mild ptosis that improved over the next six weeks. So I think the important thing um, that I've learned when I've operated in this region is that you have to respect the third nerve and it divides into two branches, an upper branch that, that uh, innervates the levator and the superior rectus and an inferior branch the, that innervates the other rectus muscles. And <clears throat> it's important that you need to come medial to the optic nerve and medial to the, the uh, levator to be able to avoid injury to the third nerve coming into those muscles from below. Otherwise, you'll leave them with permanent third nerve palsy. And that's the key to this operation. So uh, what do we do when tumors recur in this location? So the most common area for recurrence of these midline skull-based tumors, obviously, is the cavernous sinus, because that's the area that we're usually uh, quite circumspect and, and conservative with initially. And so some of these tumors in the orbit and in the cavernous sinus recur after radiation. And we do perform, in certain cases, um, a cavernous sinus resection. Here I'm bypassing high flow bypass into M2 from the external carotid to revascularize. This is a, a case of a cavernous sinus resection in a man with recurrent fungal infection of his cavernous sinus. He's got a non-functional eye. And <clears throat> we do this in a stepwise fashion. So we identify right side here, we've revascularized, so we'll tie off the carotid and then go ahead and tie off the carotid in the neck and then go ahead and divide the optic nerve. Um, remember, this is a non-functional eye and uh, we'll then divide the third nerve as well here uh, and coming in 
to the region of the cavernous sinus and then amputate across the back of the orbit. And it's important here that you get in front of the disease when you do this. So we'll amputate the posterior aspect of the orbital structures. Uh, and then uh, the hardest part of this operation is coming laterally uh, through the petrous bone and the petrous apex. And we'll go wide with this to make sure that we get an oncological removal. I'm showing you this case because it's an infection and you can see the normal anatomy. With a tumor, you don't see the normal anatomy as well. Here's the petrous carotid that I've just uh, uh, ligated. And then you open up across the petrous apex, open up the petrosal sinus, find the fifth nerve at the root entry zone and divide that and then come medially and, and then come up to the region of the cella. And you can then remove the entire cavernous sinus with the carotid. We're in the sphenoid here. We'll take out the mucosa of the sphenoid and fill with fat. What I'm not showing you here is that we also do a nasal septal flap from below endoscopically. And in this case, we'll remove the globe. In some cases, people will, will lose vision in the contralateral eye with an immunological mediative mechanism of visual loss. And so we'll remove the globe and then reconstruct with fat in the skull base. And uh, then you can see his post-op scan here. Here's the submandibular bypass graft that I put in uh, to the middle cranial fossa and, um, and also all the structures of his orbit have been removed. So this is a big operation. We have strict indications for it. Um, this is my series. I have 25 cases and we have 8% uh, perioperative mortality. So it's a big operation. We do not do this for recurrent malignant disease. We do it for recurrent benign disease after radiation treatment and failure after radiation. And finally, I just wanna leave this case for your thought because this has really made me think a lot about um, management of meningioma in general. Um, and I just use this as an example, but here's a sphenoorbital meningioma. She had a middle fossa meningioma removed and she's got proptosis, WHO grade meningioma resected in 2004. She's got thickening here, hyperostatic bone. And then she's followed along and has a, a number of suboptimal surgeries where they do partial removals. And some of these were done by neurosurgeons and some by um, ophthalmologists, but you can see there's tumor in the orbit now. And then she's had radiation therapy different times, three times um, as well. And now she's in trouble. So she's in our hands and she's got the carotid is encased with tumor. The orbit's uh, completely filled with tumor. Here's a prosthetic globe and it's now encroaching upon, it's threatening the left side. Uh, of the cavernous sinus. So now it requires an extensive surgery. And so what we'll do in this case um, is we'll go ahead and do a frontotemporal craniotomy and remove the entire globe and the contents of the orbit. And so here we're removing um, the orbit. This is a prosthetic globe. We'll just go ahead and remove that. And remember that the orbital contents are pr the primary vascular supply is from the ophthalmic artery. So if you go back to the orbital apex, you'll be able to just amputate the ophthalmic artery and then remove the contents of the orbit completely. And it's a fairly simple uh, uh, place to get to. And it's easy operation when you have a case like this where you just need to remove everything. So that's the remaining aspect of the orbit. Now we'll just go down into the face and remove the rest of the tumor. And remember, this is fairly straightforward. The only nerve we're worried about here is the seventh nerve, the facial nerve, and that's lateral to us. So as long as we stay medial here, we're going to remove the cavernous sinus anyways. We're going to remove the carotid, and we'll go ahead and then remove all the tumor right down into the face. And what I'm doing here, this is fat in the facial area and removing all the tumor from this area right down to the region of the maxillary sinus and the pterygoid region. So we'll go ahead and open up the intradural tumor. These are terrible cases, and I know you've all witnessed this as well, where the middle cerebral artery now is getting, is parasitizing, and the tumor is parasitizing blood supply from the middle cerebral itself. So you have to dissect the middle cerebral off of this tumor, and you've got to be very careful and just meth <clears throat> methodically just take the vessels that are feeding the tumor 
and leading, leaving the on passage vessels. And then once we free that up, then we can go ahead and remove the tumor completely. So here's middle fossa, here's uh, frontotemporal, there's the carotid, the optic nerve, and we'll just go ahead and remove all of that now. Now the remainder of the operation is removing the cavernous sinus, just like I showed you. But the important thing is in this case is that we're gonna to have to do an extensive reconstruction. So we usually work in teams with our ENT colleagues in this case, and we'll go ahead and we'll take fascia lata closure of the dura, and then put a free flap in because she's been radiated more than once and she's got a lot of um, uh, dead tissue. We're gonna to have to go ahead and harvest a free flap, a vascularized free flap, and this can be sewn into the neck vessels. And we'll show you after placement of the free flap, then we'll go ahead and uh, do an anastomosis uh, using the neck vessels, um, external carotid as the supply. This patient passed her balloon occlusion test, so we didn't have to worry about doing a, a bypass to the carotid, but we'll go ahead and use the extracranial vessel here, the ECA, to supply um, the free flap. So this is a long operation, it's all day, and it's an extensive operation. And my question is really, if we were more aggressive at the beginning, could we avoid this type of scenario? And are we being appropriately aggressive with some of these tumors? So here's your post-op scan. We left an EVD in as well to avoid a, a CSF leak. Uh, but in conclusion, I think orbital surgery should be familiar to skull base surgeons. It's a forgiving area. The orbital fat is really your friend. It protects the structures. You just need to understand the anatomy and where the vessels and where the nerves are running. And that's really, and, and it could be just be part of your skull base courses. Uh, it's important to know the anatomy and the orbit is a very common area for tumor occurrence with meningioma, given it is not removed completely usually. It's an important frontier. And finally, as exemplified, I think, by the last case I showed you, we need to be appropriately aggressive with the disease. It's surgically resectable and it's grade one meningioma or grade two meningioma, we usually perform a removal instead of radiation. And this is to avoid the scenario that I just showed you. And I think the risks of radiation are, are spread over the entire lifetime of the patient, whereas the risk of surgery is sort of a one-time upfront event. And it's hard to, to judge and compare the two, but we need to better calculate the entire risk of radiation over the lifetime of the patient into the treatment of the disease. And I think a lot of what happens in America is, is a lot of these tumors are not treated adequately up front with surgery and they ended up with this case of repeat radiation, repeat surgery, and then they're really in trouble down the line. So I thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here and give this lecture. Thank you very much, Professor Dada. Thank you for showing your great results in a very challenging case. And any question from audience? Yes, I would like to ask Professor Kudwell uh, a few questions. Uh, Professor Kudwell, as you ex explained in your uh, uh, slide regarding spin orbital meningiomas, you said that uh, so hyperostosis uh, is a tumor. But I would like to point out one very interesting paper that came out in all, from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in 2012, uh, where they examined the hyperostosis and uh, tumor invasion. And they had around 40 cases where there are 40 cases of meningioma. And in this meningioma of these 40 cases, 30 cases had hyperostosis. And out of these 30 cases, when they examined it, the bone was pathologically examined. They found only eight had actual tumor invasion, where the rest of us was only hyperostosis. And in sphenoid wing meningiomas, there were 10 cases where nine had hyperostosis, and out of nine, only two had proper tumor invasion. So are we justified in aggressively removing all the bones uh, in sphenoid wing meningiomas? Yeah, so it's interesting because um, 
I think there's probably two mechanisms going on here. And you, you, you mentioned that. So if, if you do enough of these cases and you drill the bone, you will see islands of tumor within the bone on many of these cases. So you'll drill the bone and you'll see little pieces of tumor in the bone. So you realize that that tumor is in the bone. But you remember I showed you that, that picture of the uh, pneumosinus dilatans where the yes. sinus gets blistered. So yeah. I, do think, I do think that the blood supply coming to the tumor probably affects the bone growth in some way. And, um, and so it may be a combination of those two, but in general, to be safe, I always consider hyperostatic bone to be part of the tumor. And the reason that I'm also aggressive is I'm trying to get the eye to come back as much as possible. So the bone can be as much of a mass as anything else uh, producing, hyper, uh, producing proptosis. So that's the, the real reason as well. In addition to tumor control, it's also to give the patient relief from the proptosis because they're uncomfortable. They have a congested eye. They've got chemosis in the eye. They may have exposure because the eye is proptotic so much. So it really gives them extra comfort if you reduce the, the compression of the, of the globe. And, and thank you very much. Another question I would like to ask is that when uh, one of our former speakers, Professor Ibrahim Shiba from Jordan, had this series of uh, uh, sphenorbital meningiomas, and he presented, uh, when he presented his lecture, he said that you deroof the superior orbital fissure. The aims of surgery are decompress the optic nerve, deroof the superior orbital fissure, and unroof the pressure relieve the pressure of the superior ophthalmic vein and inferior ophthalmic vein, because that is the key for a reduction of proptosis. How much do you agree to that? I, I agree that, that the superior ophthalmic vein is an important structure. There's no question about that. And, and I think that the, but by bone, doing the bony decompression, you achieve that as well. And that's, that's part of the same reason that I, I think it's a combination of mass effect from the bone and probably some venous congestion as well. Um, but it's dramatic how these people will feel better if you decompress their orbit ad adequately. You know. Thank you very much. My co-host, Dr. Liu Boon Singh, any questions from your side? Liu? I have, I have some questions. Yes, Professor Sagari. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, ask something about the reconstruction of the orbital wall. What, what case do you think do you need a reconstruction of the orbital wall? Sure. Yeah, that's a good question, Dr. Sugawara. Great question. So in meningiomas, I don't reconstruct for the reason that I showed you, is that we don't end up with enophthalmus. But if we do other tumors or other disease, I do try to reconstruct. So I try to close the periorbita if you can, if it's still there. And then there's other things you can do. You can use bone if you wish, uh, but we often use that little implant, that MedPore implant that we can fashion and bend and, and conform to the orbit. Um, so we do end up with enophthalmus in, in tumors other than meningiomas. And so we do try to reconstruct in those cases. And, then, and another question is, uh... In craniofacial meningeal surgery, I sometimes feel that it's very difficult to identify the tumor from the muscle, very, uh, looking very same way. But uh, can you advise me to uh, how to yeah. identify it? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with you because the tumor, as you know, and I showed a couple of cases there where the tumor invades the muscle. Um, and what I didn't show, I didn't show this one case, I didn't have time, where, where the tumor was invading the lateral rectus muscle and will remove the lateral rectus muscle. But what I do in those cases is I treat it like an oncological removal and I come widely into the muscle um, because the muscle is merely cosmetic at this point with these types of cases. And if the patient has in, invasion of the oculomotor muscles, like uh, the rectus muscles, um, then they've got diplopia already. And so it's a simple matter. If you remove the area of the muscle invasion, 
it's a simple matter for the ophthalmologist to just straighten the eye afterwards. And we'll do that. We'll just plan on removing the muscle with the nerve, um, uh, with the uh, tumor. And then with the temporalis invasion, I'm just really aggressive at coming around it. And I just keep taking it back. And you can use the ultrasonic aspirator like the CUSA um, in, in that and just keep taking the tumor until you're really obviously into normal muscle. But the plane is often indistinct. I agree with you because it's invading, you know. And uh, one another question. Uh, I have uh, more than 20 cases of the uh, extended over the exenteration with uh, tumor envelope resection, but I have never done the cavernous science resection with IC like you show. I, because I know it's very tough, difficult uh, surgery, but uh, your result was very uh, excellent result, like small uh, more mobility. But even small, you have uh, eight percent mortality. Yeah. You said. I'd like to know what was the reason of the mortality. Yeah. Sure. So uh, we had we had two patients, I think, that, that died, but they died from perioperative complications from a long ICU stay. Um, and, and one was a, a heart problem and uh, one was just an extensive. It was like they didn't die of meningitis or anything like that because we're very careful about. But, it, but these are our patients that are older, some of them that, that have been through a lot. And so they've got a lot of medical comorbidities. And this is a big operation, you know, it's an all day operation and they're in the hospital in the ICU for, usually for a couple of weeks. Uh, we drain the, uh, just, just a, a point for the younger people is I use the EVD like a lumbar drain. And so I, I put an EVD in because it's safer than putting a lumbar drain in these people because you don't have to worry about sucking air. So what I do is I put the EVD in and I drain it at the ear or just below the ear. And I leave it that way for several days when, until the, we get good closure with a vascularized flap. And that is a, a safer way to manage it than trying to manage lumbar drains. Cause we've had all sorts of complications with lumbar drains over the years where they get overdrained, and, or the nurse leaves it open uh, mistakenly and the patient gets into trouble. So. Uh, we do leave an EVD for CSF diversion for a while. And then obviously then they, they require a lot of um, just general care. They get DVTs or uh, deep vein thrombosis. They get pulmonary emboli, some of them, those types of things. And uh, so those are, that's the mortality is the length of the operation and the elderly patient with comorbidities. So that, that's what I warn people about. And that's one of the reasons that I've stopped doing it for malignant disease. I don't do it for malignant tumors at all because I don't think that it's extended a uh, lifespan and it puts the patient through so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank Any you. other question? Liu, would you like to comment? Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks Raja. Thanks Professor for a very nice presentation. Professor, I want to find out from you uh, I have a few cases. Uh, one case that uh, post uh, exenteration of the eye, there's a CSF leak uh, around the optic nerve, the optic nerve. How do we deal about it? Uh, my right. second question, Professor, uh, I had uh, came across one case of uh, implant meningioma caused a hypoostosis of the uh, a roof and the lateral wall orbit. Uh, but the, surprisingly, when we do a frontal uh, temporal craniotomy of it, uh, over the convexity, the dura are not well formed. So I need to extend the craniotomy. Uh, how far do we actually need to find the normal dura to make sure that uh, 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 complete uh, uh, dura, uh, 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 watertight dura closure in these kind of cases? My last question, Professor, uh, in case that when you open up the, the orbiter and the periorbital fat come out and obstructing your view, what's the best way to deal with it? Thank you, Professor. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so the, the, the question about the CSF leak first, um, so that does occur, and, and I've had it, I just had it uh, a, a week or two ago with a patient that cavernous malformation that I showed you. Um, so if you open the dura through an orbitotomy approach, or if you have a big approach where you've exenterated the eye, 
you need to make sure that you seal it off well. You close the soft tissue well. Sometimes we'll put fat in the defect. You'll see how I closed. We put a lot of fat in the area and that gives a seal. And then we'll also divert CSF. In that one with the temporal uh, cab mal I showed you, he had a little bit of CSF the first day post-op from his incision here. And what I did, I just put a lumbar drain in for three days and it would stopped and it was fine. And he did well. So you've got to be careful because you don't have the traditional closure of dura with these little approaches. And then if you do an extensive approach, you need to really make sure that you've got vascularized tissue. Now, um, the, the, this, the question about the periorbital fat, when you, when it's, you said it was herniating and getting in your way? Yes, your Professor. Yes. Yeah, so it, we use self-retaining retractors all the time. They're beautiful for the periorbital area because the orbital fat herniates and the self-retaining retractors are a great way to go with that. And then your third question, the second question you asked was, how much dura do you remove? I, we try to make the bone flap on these hyperostotic cases. And I, I have one case that I didn't show you, but the whole side of the head was hyperostosis. So you have to make a decision about how much bone removal and how much dura you're going to remove. But in general, if it's surgically accessible, we'll try to remove all the hyperostotic bone and the, and the dura underlying the hyperostotic bone. Because I think that the tumor is inducing the hyperostosis, either invasion or for the other reasons we talked about. So you've got to get the tumor out of there and you've got to get the, the dura out of there as well as the bone. So sometimes we'll end up doing like a hemicraniectomy on some of these people and an orbital decompression as well. Because the bone, as you know, the bone can thicken all the way back to the middle fossa floor, right back to the petrous bone. It can involve the convexity as well. So you've got to be aggressive at removing all of that. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank, thank you very much. I think because of lack of time, we can wind this up. Uh, I would like to ask just one question, a uh, question about endoscopic optic nerve fenestration. Uh, how much do you think is uh, actually going to help in idiopathic intracranial hypertension? Yeah, so we, we do that our, um, and we do it with our ophthalmologists. Uh, it's part of a sort of multi-treatment plan algorithm that we have. Um, it's a simple thing to do, um, uh, fenestration, and we can do it transfacially, as you know, and endoscopically, I think, um, I think it, it works in some cases. Um, I like to do it before I commit somebody to a shunt. I don't take care of many of these patients anymore. I have a partner that does it, but I like to avoid a shunt if I can. And, and if you've got a young patient losing vision, we do the usual things like we, we, you know, we try medication, um, uh, acetazolamide and, and that sort of thing. And we'll try weight loss, but that's difficult for a, a lot of Americans um, to do that. And then uh, we'll also do an angiogram on them to see if there's any venous congestion anywhere. And we have stented a couple of patients with venous outflow problems. And if there's none of that, then we'll go to optic nerve fenestration if they fail that, and then we'll shunt them ultimately. So we, we do it as part of an algorithm. It doesn't always work in everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. So it was indeed a very exciting lecture and we learned a lot from you. We can hear the concluding remarks from Professor Sugawara before we go into the second lecture. Um, I'd like to thank you again for your valuable time and your amazing videos and obviously your expert such a technique. And uh, I look forward to having you with us and for another session in the future. Thank you very much again. Thank, thank you, you, Professor thank Sugawara. You. Thank you very much. So I will invite Professor Nobutaka Hori to say a short introduction and invite Professor Guan Sheng in turn. Before, yeah, please do that. All right, so let's move on to the uh, second lecture. Uh, my name is Nobutaka Hori, the neurosurgery uh, professor in the new uh, Hiroshima University. You know, the endovascular aneurysm calling is becoming a major part in cerebrovascular neurosurgery and uh, many trials have been achieved uh, to the target for the complicated aneurysm. For example, the wide neck, very wide neck aneurysm, or the large or giant aneurysm. Today, we have the uh, uh, special lecture from the uh, 
uh, Professor Guan Shen in China. His topic is the uh, application of stents aimed to correct flow on uh, aneurysm neck. Please start your lecture. Okay, uh, thanks for uh, your production, uh, introduction, uh, Professor uh, Hori. <clears throat> Uh, uh, after after gave the the title of the lecture to Dr. Xu Bin, uh, I really uh, made a summarize about my experience for the treatment of uh, the aneurysm. You know, I start to do the intervention radiology since nineteen ninety two. Uh, but uh, since uh, 2000, uh, I started to to, uh, to do the neural intervention radiology. Uh, since 1913, I focused on only on neurosurgery. But uh, at the biggest size hospital in China, the first affiliated hospital of Zhengzhou University, uh, in my center, uh, last year, the therapy procedure uh, is nearly 2000 and uh, aneurysm treatment uh, uh, accounts for nearly half. So till now, more than 5,000 uh, intracranial aneurysms were treated by myself or consulted uh, by myself. So uh, recalling the, the experience, uh, we, we can uh, have the, uh, the feeling uh, since uh, from the calling only, because at that time we had no proper stand. Uh, so for intervention radiology, uh, high re recurrence uh, is not ev evident. Mm, but uh, with the neuroform, uh, uh, silk, uh, and the uh, uh, enterprise of uh, uh, more uh, intracranial stand available, the efficacy is proved. Till now, for all the procedure of in, intracranial aneurysm, the application of intracranial stain uh, accounts for more than 70%. And the recurrent rate has decreased below the 10%. Uh, when we enter the, the age of fluid water, uh, it's better. Surely it's better than uh, stay assist quality. But for fluid water, it's not perfect if you could not focus on the neck. So in summary, uh, the key point uh, to cure aneurysm and try to lower the risk, uh, all we can do is try to correct the flow on neck, whether you choose a clipping or a, a plate or use a coils, a stem coils for that water or cover stain. Uh, but we have to make the protocol individually, including the patient's whole body condition and the local aneurysm and the doctor's experience and the uh, uh, devices available uh, provided by your hospital. Uh, just like this case, uh, is a middle-aged male and it's not rupture, but this patient uh, are complicated with erosive gastritis. So uh, we have no proper balloon at that time. So with double microcaster and then the two or frame coils, and uh, yes, we do the, the, the embolize. And it's right after the operation and the long-term good results. It's another uh, complicated case. This case is a uh, 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 Moya Moya disease. And uh, he was found uh, of aneurysm on the tip of the basic artery. Uh, consider of the outflow artery uh, is too thin, too tiny. So we decided to do the uh, coding only. With uh, the bigger size, you know, the, the biggest size of the aneurysm sac is uh, about uh, eight millimeter. So we choose the uh, first, the frame, framing coil uh, is a uh, nine millimeter. So with the big sizer, 
<coughs> big size uh, of the first uh, framing coil, we do the density packing. And uh, it's the uh, angiography right after the operation. And it's a uh, six months uh, follow up. The aneurysm was cured. But uh, most of the uh, intracranial aneurysm was just like this. Uh, a uh, wider neck uh, compared with the uh, parent artery. Uh, we can call it, but uh, it's more safe and uh, effective when we use a uh, stain-assisted coil. Uh, whether you use a uh, solitaire or enterprise or, or what kind of uh, intracranial stain, it's okay. And uh, it's a, have a good long-term results. So uh, stain-assisted coiling, uh, obviously, it's more safe and uh, effective. But when we think of the uh, apply application of stain, uh, the first uh, uh, balance have to be made, namely, it's a rupture or unrupture. We have to balance the risk of uh, antiplatelet uh, medicine use usage and the benefit of better long-term efficacy of the stain. Just like this, uh, wide neck bifurcation aneurysm uh, located on the marginal and the pericolosal artery of corpus pollosa. Uh, there's a very tiny uh, loose packing on the neck, but uh, obviously six months later it recovered. So if, if, if it's a ruptured aneurysm, it's acceptable. But if it's an unruptured, it's not. Uh, acceptable. I think we should uh, change the protocol to stain assist coding because uh, this uh, kinds of uh, stains can correct the angio uh, and the flow between the uh, inflow and outflow. Uh, almost the same, uh, uh, the similar case, uh, stain assisted coding and uh, uh, good. Uh, long-term results. Uh, but for the uh, fusiform uh, complex uh, uh, flow, just like this, uh, the left right, uh, left uh, middle cerebral artery aneurysm, uh, stasis the calling have to be uh, choose. Uh, among all the pro uh, uh, protocol, Coils assisted multi stents reconstruction are most commonly used for such kind of aneurysm. It's right after operation and uh, uh, 20 months later, uh, it uh, was uh, almost a total reconstruction. Uh, another uh, condition is about the ruptured aneurysm. Uh, the typical uh, uh, cases is uh, blood least uh, aneurysm. For this type, uh, special type of uh, intracranial aneurysm, uh, many uh, protocol can be uh, choosed. A single stem cause, a multi stem cause, a calf stem with or without cause, uh, fluid water with cause, and uh, fluid water plus cover stem. Uh, Especially for the multi stain plus coils, we have achieved high occlusion, low complication, and recurrence. Uh, till now, uh, in, in China, we have more than uh, 100 uh, BBA uh, treated with uh, fluid water and coils. Uh, we have no report uh, recurrence for the treatment of BBA. It's a typical uh, BBA. Uh, treated with coils and uh, fluid water, and uh, it's uh, have a good result uh, for the short time uh, follow up. And uh, there are report about uh, the uh, large example of BBA treatment with fluid water, and the the efficacy could be uh, accepted because the complete population occlusion rates are. Uh, nearly uh, more than 70%. And the recurrent rate is acceptable, is about uh, 13%. Uh, 
so the flow the water treat uh, BBA uh, could be uh, safe and effective. But uh, it's my uh, third case after I use the flow the water to treat BBA. Uh, you can see the uh, totals uh, uh, parent artery. And uh, I just uh, uh, deliver a, a co one coil and it not did the uh, density packing on the sap. But I think uh, the flow dye water can uh, correct the flow on the net. So uh, it's the first time uh, only one coil and the one flow dye water. But one week later, uh, the follow up of angiography uh, demonstrated the, the increase of the sac, namely in a short, very short time, uh, it's recurring. So, in order to uh, correct the uh, abnormal flow on the net, uh, we choose the, the, the videos, namely the homemade uh, cover stain. Uh, was implanted through the through the water, and it's right after the uh, operation, and the four months after release, uh, the BBA was cured, and the nine months follow up, the CTA demonstrated the total reconstruction. Uh, many. A uh, specialist insists if the neck of the intracranial aneurysm is narrow, so no need to use a uh, stem. Mm, to my opinion, for a narrow neck, uh, you can have more choice. You can use stem or not. But if you can uh, treat or cure the, the aneurysm with the assistance of stem, okay, you can use it. But for wide neck, uh, maybe we uh, stain would be a pro preferred tool. Just like this, uh, of ophthalmic uh, artery uh, aneurysm. Uh, actually, the neck is uh, a, a little bit wider than the parent artery. Uh, maybe assisted by uh, stain, it could be uh, dealt with uh, easily. But if the patient uh, has the contraindication about the uh, double antiplatelet medicine, uh, so we choose the uh, coiling. Still, we use the a larger size of the first frame coil and the uh, 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 density packing on the neck. And the patient was cured six months later. But for sidewall, and uh, the fusy form uh, is totally different because for sidewall, just like that, uh, the last uh, 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 cases, it has more choice. But for fusy form, we have to uh, assist by uh, stand, just like this, uh, in a similar uh, to BBA, but it's unruptured, unruptured aneurysm. So uh, just assist by solitaire AB. Uh, and the coils, it was uh, almost uh, uh, cured. And uh, the 18 months later, uh, it, it shows uh, total re reconstruction, occlusion. Uh, for the uh, mechanism of stain assist coiling, uh, all, all we know it's more, it can provide more mental uh, cover on the neck and it can straighten the angle between the uh, inflow and outflow. And uh, the stain the struts and the uh, coils on the neck uh, can provide uh, uh, easy for the endocellularization. Uh, for the rupture aneurysm and the complex uh, uh, flow, just like this one, uh, I start to uh, use uh, Follow the water and the coils, because for this case, uh, she has only two uh, choice: a bypass or a coils assistant multi uh, conventional stem reconstruction. 
but compared with the uh, uh, multiple conventional uh, stent with fluoride water, maybe fluoride water is more easy and safe. So for this patient, uh, we choose the fluoride water and uh, it's right after the uh, operation and the uh, uh, four months follow up, the sac uh, was reconstructed uh, gradually and the patient is safe. And the seven months later, uh, the uh, MRI showed the good result. For the other cases of a uh, huge uh, field form uh, aneurysm uh, for the right uh, internal carotid artery, uh, although uh, with uh, coils assistant uh, multi fluid water, uh, this patient uh, has a good result. Only six months, the huge field form aneurysm was reconstructed uh, totally. Uh, almost the same case uh, occurs. Uh, on the uh, posterior, you can see the uh, uh, pica uh, right from the sac. Uh, coils uh, uh, assistant multi layer stain, uh, conventional stain, uh, local reconstruction. And uh, only uh, eight months it was uh, uh, reconstructed totally. And uh, 20 months follow up showed the good results. So uh, compared with uh, stain, conventional stain assist calling with uh, fluid water, we have to balance uh, between the safety and the efficacy, especially for the ophthalmic artery aneurysm and the middle cerebral artery aneurysm. Just like these two cases, uh, almost the same uh, uh, ophthalmic uh, uh, artery aneurysm. The first one I have showed you, uh, it was uh, calling sing, uh, singly. Uh, and uh, six months later, it, it was uh, cured. Uh, on the right side, uh, the patient was uh, treated with uh, coils and the fluid water. But the six months uh, follow up, it was not cured. So uh, these different results. I think uh, results from the, the correct, if the uh, abnormal blood flow uh, be uh, uh, corrected on the neck. Another condition is about the cover stain. Uh, when compared with a stain, a conventional stain and the fluid water, cover stain uh, has a unique uh, uh, function but uh, its limitation is uh, obvious. Uh, namely, it demands uh, strictly anatomy and uh, hemodynamics. Uh, because Karsten is isolated uh, the aneurysm on the neck from parent artery, it can correct the blood flow on neck immediately and uh, persistently. Uh, in China, we have a, a homemade uh, intracranial uh, cover stain, uh, namely Willis. Uh, primarily, uh, the indication is about uh, damage of artery wall, namely the pseudo aneurysm and uh, some uh, CCF. Uh, but for uh, the supraclinoid uh, narrow neck large aneurysm and the dissection, and sometimes BBA and the more indication uh, are commonly applied, applicated, uh, uh, applied in clinical practice. But all these cases have to be uh, proper anatomy uh, on the parent artery. Just like this uh, special type of uh, subclinoid, large sac, narrow neck, especially uh, there is a jet line on the neck. Uh, all we know is a very difficult, tough cases. Even we use uh, multi fluid water, uh, the uh, later uh, hemorrhage occurred, and the, the rate is not very low. Uh, according to Sachi, uh, come from Turkey, uh, it's almost uh, 8% for these special uh, types of intracranial allergen. 
But uh, if we use a uh, Karsten to deal with this special type, you can see uh, it's a very, very uh, isolated, uh, the uh, normal blood flow on the neck, uh, isolated the neck, uh, the, the, the sac with the paired artery immediately and persistently. And uh, it's the uh, follow up. And another case is almost the same. Uh, Superclinoid, uh, narrow neck, and uh, a huge sac uh, isolated with carbstain right after the operation and the nine months uh, later. Uh, the longest uh, follow up time is uh, more than 40 months. And uh, the uh, narrow rate of intracranial stain stenosis rate is acceptable, is uh, less than 10. Uh, you know, for this special type, uh, before uh, fluid water uh, and the uh, carsten, uh, many uh, center just use uh, stain assist calling, just like this, uh, stain with uh, Leo, Leo plus, and uh, many coils. Uh, it was uh, uh, recurrent, even two times uh, treatment uh, with stereo system calling. The second, uh, the, uh, the doctor used another enterprise, but uh, it's the angiography right after the second operation. About six months later, the neck uh, obviously uh, recovered. And uh, the patient was uh, followed up further on the 18th month after the second uh, uh, procedure. The, and the recurrence becomes uh, obvious. So, and uh, another case is almost the same. Uh, 12 months later, after the first uh, stay assist calling, the aneurysm occurred. And uh, one year later, after the second operation, uh, the second time still with uh, stay assist calling. For these two cases, uh, we choose the uh, cover stain to isolate the neck from uh, parent artery, and it's right after the uh, operation and the five months follow-up showed uh, uh, the perfect reconstruction. For this case, it's almost the same. Uh, intro the two conventional uh, stent, we uh, introduce the carb stain. It's a balloon dilated carb stain. So we don't uh, worry about the uh, apposition. So this case uh, uh, reminds us the key point to cure flow-related aneurysm, uh, uh, correct of abnormal hemodynamics on neck is the key point. Uh, for carbstain, it can play the role of instantly and the persist persistently uh, treatment. Uh, for small aneurysm, uh, maybe many specialists uh, don't advocate, uh, don't suggest uh, flow that water. But if we use flow that water, we could uh, overlook the size and the location. We just focus on the neck and uh, the parent artery. Uh, flow that water, the indication. Uh, was a larger and gen aneurysm. But uh, even for this uh, indication, fluid water is not mighty enough to uh, neglect it the former. Because we know fluid water is just a braided stain. It has dense net and it has provided a higher mental recovery on neck uh, only by stain without uh, uh, coils. And uh, more important, it uh, caused uh, ideal innovation. Namely, uh, it, uh, uh, 
introduce our attention from the SEC to parent artery. But uh, still for the special type uh, superclinoid uh, huge sac uh, narrow neck uh, jet line, uh, only treated with fluid water, uh, the patient uh, died of, uh, because of the rib bleeding. So for this type, uh, coils, stain assist coils, multi stainer with coils, flow that water or flow that water with coils or multi flow that waters may not correct the abnormal hemodynamics on neck. Uh, it's another case uh, of disasters occurred after the three, uh, after the, uh, the flow that water with coils. Only one uh, flow that water. It's another case uh, re bleeding after 10 days later uh, with three flow that water uh, covered the stem, covered the, the neck. For this type, uh, nowadays our stretch day is. Uh, uh, a weather staged uh, operation. Namely, the first uh, operation is to just uh, fill coils in a sack. And uh, one month later or uh, later or sooner, we can do the second operation uh, with for the water. Otherwise, uh, we have to try to use multi flow, uh, uh, sometimes three or four and with many coils, uh, even that we could not guarantee uh, the safety after the procedure. Uh, actually, another choice is uh, carsten. So uh, efficacy of many huge or complex aneurysms were improved by fluid water. But uh, just like uh, many cases showed, risk is not disappeared. And uh, for the very special type of uh, superclinoid, huge sac, narrow neck, and the jet line, the rebleeding rate is almost uh, 8%. So uh, even uh, we enter into the age of flow of water, but we still have to focus on the neck even uh, after flow of water. So by this, uh, uh, with this, uh, idea when we encounter such kind of cases. So we try to uh, focus on the neck. For this case, uh, it's the angiograph after the first flow of water and uh, uh, less coils. We can see the jet line is, is still obvious. So no stop, uh, we introduced uh, another the second flow of water. And, uh, the angiography after the second for the water implantation, uh, the jet dam uh, was uh, there, uh, was decreased, obviously. But we still uh, uh, filled more coils on the area of uh, inflow. And uh, uh, it has good uh, wall opposition. And one week later, uh, this patient only have a residue on the neck area. And uh, six months or uh, three months later, and the uh, six months later, uh, the, this uh, special type intracoronal aneurysm was uh, uh, cured. And it's a uh, one month, one year later follow up. But we, when we encountered such a complex cases, it's a huge sac uh, complicated with uh, thrombus in the sac and a large area of uh, dissection and a very tortuous uh, uh, route. Uh, we uh, combined the tube bridge uh, uh, channel made uh, through that water with uh, the 
Kavistan, I just mentioned, uh, Willis, uh, combine these two uh, special uh, intracranial stand together. Just uh, with fluid water, we try to uh, deal with the long distance uh, dissection. And uh, for the neck, because there is an inject line and the uh, 180 degree uh, inflow angle. So we use the Karsten to correct the normal blood flow uh, immediately and persistently. So it's right after the uh, operation. And uh, okay, actually this patient has more uh, long-term results and uh, it totally uh, cured. It's another case, uh, almost the same. Uh, we use the fluid water firstly, then uh, introduce a, a, the, the cover stain, just a, a, a stride uh, aside the, the neck of the aneurysm. And right after the operation, uh, it's a vascular CT demonstrate the, the wall opposition of the flow diverter and the uh, cover stain. So in order to correct flow on the neck of the aneurysm, we have many methods. Uh, uh, coils can uh, uh, play the, the same function. Namely with coils, we can correct the flow from set, but uh, we have to uh, use a special skill. Uh, in China, many doctors start to use a larger size you know, framing coil or the uh, feeding coil. But from the sac, we try to uh, frame uh, framing on the neck of the aneurysm. Uh, if we use a stain, uh, assistant coil, namely combine a coil stain to correct the, the flow, it uh, will uh, provide us a safe and easy procedure. And the uh, stain can straighten the angle between in and out flow, especially uh, 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 indicated for the sidewall types. For fluid water, uh, it can also correct the flow uh, on neck just uh, from the parent artery. And the curve stain is to isolate the sac from parent artery. So uh, for this uh, kind of aneurysm, intracranial stain can help to increase the rate of success. Namely, it can make our procedure uh, easily and safe. Till now, we have more than 20 sorts of intracranial aneurysm available in China. Uh, so we have um, multiple selection, uh, namely uh, car, uh, laser cut stain, uh, braided uh, stain, and uh, fluid water or car stain. And uh, the indication has been uh, wider, uh, including narrow neck, uh, including ruptured aneurysm. And uh, uh, most of the cases uh, with stain assistant calling or reconstruction, it will choose uh, better results. And uh, till now, uh, from our center, we have the confidence to cure uh, less than a 20 millimeter intracranial aneurysm, aneurysm. Could be cured. So in my center, uh, fluid water and uh, assistant calling stent uh, are applied uh, the amount of the stain uh, application accounts for more than 70% for all the procedure. And it improved the long-term results and the no increase in complications. Maybe many uh, uh, Western country uh, doctors, uh, they don't agree to use uh, stain, especially during the uh, urgent state. Uh, namely the rupture early state. Uh, 
we worry about the uh, double uh, antiplatelet medicine. But uh, till now, we uh, use uh, tirofibin uh, during the procedure. And uh, only if the procedure is uh, smoothly and uh, uh, in a very short time uh, fi finished, uh, sometimes we only use one antiplatelet medicines. So uh, such a uh, method uh, has improved uh, the safety uh, Paro procedure, paro operation. So in a summary, uh, uh, there is a saying, idea, uh, dominate action. So if we focus on the uh, correct uh, of, uh, blood flow on neck, uh, many protocol should be polished. So when we uh, choose an intracranial aneurysm, we should not uh, focus on the set. And uh, we have to change the idea to correct the flow on the neck of aneurysm. Okay, uh, it's all my uh, sharing about my uh, experience of treatment of internal aneurysm. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, uh, Professor Shen. Uh, the, your message uh, to correct the uh, flow on the neck is very important for to the. Uh, our uh, endovascular neurosurgeon to compete the, uh, you know, the recurrent aneurysm. So the, this presentation is open to the audience. So any questions or comments to the uh, web, from the web? Yeah. Dr. Liu, any questions from you? I don't have any questions. Thanks, for that. Thank you, Professor, for a nice presentation. All um, right, I have some, a couple of questions. So the, you the presented some of the uh, wonderful cases treated with the covered stent. But the, I'm the afraid that you know, the covered stent has a risk to, you know, the, if the covered stent uh, can uh, keep the patency of the small vessels, for example, the uh, uh, anterior choroidal artery or some, you know, the small perforators. So what do you think about that? Yes, uh, the diameter uh, of the car stent is three to four point five, so it on uh, it uh, commonly used uh, uh, on the segmental uh, six five uh, of the inter internal carotid artery and uh, the vertebral segmental uh, four. So it has a strictly indication for the uh, local anatomy because it could not cover the important branches, such as the pica, such as the, uh, the or how to say? How about the uh, perforators? They say the, uh, you know, the uh, perforator from the MCA or the anterior choroidal artery, very tiny arteries. Pica is probably okay, I think, but the, you know, the uh, anterior choroidal artery is critical. You know, if you occurred in the, in the cover. Yes, it, it could not use uh, for the <laughs> wide uh, for the uh, bifurcation aneurysm. It's obvious. Okay, and uh, one more question. The you mentioned that the uh, treatment concept uh, depending on the uh, side or or fusion formalism, right? And the uh, uh, there is another type of the you know aneurysm, the terminal type. So the terminal type aneurysm, let's say the basal artery or the ACOM or uh, MC aneurysm has more chance to get a recurrence of the aneurysm. So it is, you know, the uh, very challenging in some times. And uh, in Japan, we uh, treat the, uh, the using not the flow diverter, uh, using the uh, web or pulse rider, the, you know, current uh, flow disruption devices to fight against the recurrent aneurysm. So the, what do you think about the, the, uh, the concept using the, not using the flow diverter, uh, using the uh, uh, web or pulse rider for the terminal type aneurysm, not sidewall? Yes, yes, we have the same uh, experience with you. Uh, we start to use flow diverter to treat the middle cerebral artery since 2016, uh, 
we uh, at, at the first time we try to treat the complex uh, uh, flow of the complex uh, aneurysm. Uh, we uh, we treated uh, nearly 70, 70 cases. Uh, uh, after the retrospective analysis, we found the ischemic stroke uh, complications is more than 10 percent, nearly 17 percent. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit higher. So nowadays, uh, uh, we just uh, uh, use fluid water to treat the uh, complex uh, aneurysm, such as uh, if it could not uh, be treated with a single calling, even with stay assist calling, it's very dangerous. Uh, so if the patient uh, don't want to accept the bypass, we would try to use fluid water, including the an anterior uh, communicator artery. Right. Any questions from? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Shen. That was uh, uh, terrific. And I agree with much of your philosophy about the flow into the neck of the aneurysm. I'm not an endovascular specialist, but I do a lot of open surgery, but we have a mini um, endovascular cases done in our department. And I'm very interested in the covered stent because this then takes care of the problem with rebleeding and ruptured aneurysms. And we've had the same experience as you with the standard flow diverters for the proximal um, dorsal variant aneurysms, you call them BBAs, um, uh, where we've had patients rebleed. Um, our endovascular people put multiple, multiple uh, uh, flow diverters in to try and reduce that. But the, the problem that we've had with covered stents is that the traditional ones in America, they have difficulty navigating up into the area. What's different about your stent and is it commercially available? Yes, it's a commercially available in China since 2015. 15. And okay. uh, it, uh, it was a blown dilated uh, cover stent. It's a laser cut stent. Uh, uh, before the middle uh, uh, caster was uh, used in, in clinical practice, it's very difficult to deliver it up to the target uh, area. But nowadays, with five French and middle uh, media uh, caster, uh, we can introduce the, the the villis, uh, the cover stain, easily to reach the, the target uh, area. So you, it's not a problem. Do you think that um, if, if you have an unruptured aneurysm, and most of the time they're using flow diverters for unruptured aneurysms as in, in America, as you mentioned, um, do you think that there's any advantage to a covered stent in an unruptured aneurysm, or should we just use traditional flow diverters? Yes, uh, I have mentioned uh, for the very uh, special type, such as uh, supraclinoid, narrow neck, huge sac, and the jet line on the neck. Sometimes uh, even we use uh, two to three, even four uh, fluid water. It could not stop the, yeah. the jet line on the neck. And uh, the sac could be uh, increased after the procedure lately. and. Uh, uh, rebleeding or occur. Uh, many centers have such kind of uh, disaster occur. Yes. So uh, we, we try to solve the problem. So with uh, fluid water and uh, cover stand. I mean, it, it, I, I try to emphasize to our, uh, our young people, and I think it's important that flow diversion is the only aneurysm treatment that looks better over time. Like, you know, even clipping has a recurrence rate and, and coiling has a, has a much higher recurrence rate, but flow diversion looks better over time. The longer you go, the better it looks. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a real game changer. It's a great treatment for a lot of these aneurysms. And I thank you for your, your knowledge and your advancement of that. Thank you very much, Professor William Kudwell for this. Uh wonderful pearls of wisdom. I would like to call upon Dr. Srihari who is here. Yes, Professor Srihari. 
uh thank you sir for the invitation and a good lecture uh my uh, doubt is just regarding the follow up how frequently follow up the stent uh, coiling and or your cover stent following what is the protocol you follow in the follow up uh, pattern it is expensively or yearly the angiograms you repeat that is one question i have uh, so if we just use the flow of water so we can be followed by uh, ct cta ct angiography uh, if we use the fluid water with coils, uh, so we choose the uh, high resolution MRI, especially the three division space uh, uh, frequency. But uh, about one year, uh, we have well, we suggest the patient to do the angiography. That's our protocol of the flow follow. Mm -hmm. And how long you recommend, sir, for the antiplated usage, dual as well as single, flow diverter as well as instant? Oh, uh, it depends on the wall position. If the wall position is good, maybe three, uh, we usually uh, use three months uh, anti, double antiplatelet. And after that, we can uh, decrease uh, only one uh, uh, antiplatelet. But if the uh, flow diverter was used on the uh, bifurcation and the uh, important branch uh, right from the, the, the sac or the or right from the parent artery, it was covered by the fluid water. Maybe uh, the patient have to accept uh, six months antiplatelet, double antiplatelet. After that, uh, it depends on the follow-up. Uh, maybe the patient have to be used uh, antiplatelet or uh, at, uh, at least the one antiplated medicine or for more than one year or maybe whole life. We don't know. One time, Sir, one what, time to, to start to take. What is your uh, incidence in having the indimental hypoplasia in flow diverter, sir? How frequently you see the indimental hypoplasia? Pardon? He's talking about the indimental hypoplasia. hypoplasia. After flow day for deployment, if you follow up some of the patients develop this uh, intimate hyperplasia. You mean uh, intrastent uh, stenosis? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. It's a pretty low yeah. growth. And, uh, it's, a, it's a common phenomenon after the uh, application of that water, especially for the short time uh, and the mid time uh, follow up. Uh, but according to our ex experience, uh, if the Stenosis, intracranial stenosis is not serious, namely uh, it's less than uh, five, five, uh, 1,500 percent. Uh, you just uh, insist on the double antiplatelet or uh, change the tick uh, 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 reeler to the, uh, or to change it, to replace the uh, blue clobidal. Yes, clobidal. Change the clopidol, replace the clopidol with a uh, tigrillo. Uh, then follow up uh, more time, uh, maybe uh, one year, a large part of the intracranial stasis disappeared or improved. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for the Thank you very much. Discussion. I think because of lack of time, we can wind this up. Professor Sugawara, would you like to comment? Would you like to say something, Professor Gavara? Um, I have heard the reason of the uh, ICH after flow diverter. Uh, the, the reason is uh, hyperperfusion. Is that right? Because I don't understand the, why the hyperperfusion occur after flow diverter. Because you know, if the uh, there is no ischemic I mean, the uh, misery perfusion or something, uh, the hyperperfusion doesn't occur. Professor, would you like to answer that? Uh, uh, the, uh, when we named the hyperperfusion, uh, uh, usually after the procedure, patient uh, complained the uh, headache or uh, Examined by CT, uh, demonstrated the, the hemorrhage or the hematoma. Uh, but uh, 
it is really caused by the hyperperfusion. Maybe it's a pseudo uh, name. Uh, you know, for the huge set, because the set uh, is a pole to uh, elevate the, the pressure. But uh, after the flow that water, uh, more blood flow uh, uh, that water to the to the uh, intracranial uh, par parachemo. Uh, at that time, if we uh, examine the patient with TCD, and only under the condition of the uh, intracranial flow were increased, so uh, we have to uh, control the blood pressure. Uh, usually. Uh, 20 percent, 15 to 20 percent after procedure, and uh, sometimes we use uh, cortisol to uh, to decrease the, the the uncomfortable of the patient. Um, my understanding is the uh, you know the hyperperfusion happened. Just uh, when the no, sac is or big, big. So even if the uh, blood flow increase, if there there was no uh, basal polarisis, it's uh, not the reason. I think the hyperperfusion. I just think about yeah. Professor Hori. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So the you know the post-operative hemorrhage is not always coming from the hyperperfusion. Uh, yeah. So the sometimes the, the several blood flow increase after the you know obliteration of the aneurysm, but not always. So the main cause of the hemorrhage coming from the uh, jet flow after the placement of the flow diverter. That's why we uh, always put the coils with flow diverter. Mm -hmm. And one more the. Uh, uh, especially the Asian people, we have the, uh, some, you know, the brain damage, let's say the microbreeze or something like that. So the, in such cases, the, if we uh, put two drugs, the double uh, antiperative therapy, they can have the uh, higher chance to breathe the, uh, you know, the, the damage, the, the hemorrhage from the damaged brain. That's my understanding. Oh, Sandy. <laughs> I, I agree with you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Actually, you. the the hemorrhage after flow that water in the parenchyma uh, uh, may be caused by the new occurred uh, ischemic stroke and the double antiplatelet function. Yeah. Right. Not uh, caused by hyperperfusion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can close this session and hear the Concluding remarks from Professor Hori. Yes, uh, thank you again for the great uh, lecture, uh, Professor Shen. Uh, now the new design uh, devices are coming, including a uh, covered stand. Uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, available in the in Japan, the United States, right? So the, we need to share the you know the difficult cases to fight against the recurrent of the aneurysm. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. It was indeed a wonderful presentation and we learned a lot from you. So with that, I would like to wind this session. I would like to inform our viewers that uh, uh, this webinar has been broadcasted on three different channels, which is YouTube, Zoom, and WeChat channel. And today we have around 975 people who have joined us live. So thank you very much for everybody who joined. So on behalf of it, the president of ACNS, Professor Yoko Kato, and the Education Committee of the ACNS. I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor William Goodwell and uh, Professor Guan Sheng, and the chairs, Professor Takashi Sugawara and Professor Nobutaka Hori, for their time and support for the ACNS webinars. So until we all meet on next Wednesday, it is bye bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.